Hello, everybody, and welcome to the PT on Ice Daily Show. My name is Christina Previtt. I am one of the two lead faculty for modern management of the older adult. We teach two online courses and one live courses on everything Jerry PT. And actually, this weekend, we're in my side of the border, so I'm a Canadian. We are in British Columbia in both Victoria and Vancouver. We're doing a dual site uh, course this weekend looking at modern management of the older adult. We also are launching our new advanced concepts online course in the next several days. So we are really in the weeds of the research to make sure that we have a really up-to-date literature review for you guys for advanced concepts. We launched that March 11th. In order to take modern management of the older adult advanced concepts, you have to have taken the online version of Essential Foundations because we really deep dive into exercise prescription and programming, and then we apply that to clinical populations in advanced concepts, which is really exciting. It's really, well, I geek out about this stuff, so I think it's super fun, Uh, but it's a prerequisite for the course, just so you know, if you're looking at the advanced concepts course. So one of the things that um, we've really been deep diving into and we weren't really sure in advanced concepts if it was something that we wanted to really include or not was around the assumptions on neurological evaluation and assessment. As an, I'm an outpatient therapist, Dustin has been in the home health arena. We tend to tackle things a little bit differently Uh, usually because people are coming in with quite a spread of functional um, resiliency and reserve. And it means that unless we're in inpatient or outpatient stroke rehab or we're working in a movement disorders clinic or in neuro clinics in general, uh, we tend to not utilize the skill set of the neurological evaluation as much. That being said, and I don't know if you guys will agree or disagree with me, but I have noticed in my practice that there are plenty of people who have been diagnosed with different conditions, whether they have had some sort of traumatic neurological onset like a stroke or a traumatic SCI or have been living with a neurodegenerative condition for quite some time, but they're living in the community and obviously that is a, a, a It's a consequence, a good consequence of advancements in medications as well as detection of these conditions so that people are being able to stay at a level of functional resiliency that allows them to be in their home for longer. And they're oftentimes seeking rehab. And then we have to almost quickly scramble as outpatient therapists and put our neurological PT hat on. Because of that, I thought that we would break down a little bit around the neurological eval or things that as an outpatient therapist, I want to make sure that I really remember. I've done PT on Ice podcasts before where I've been looking at just a basic scan of neuroanatomy, neurophysiology, and how important that is for knowing prognosis, healing timelines, and the expectation of functional recovery for individuals with neurological insults. And so we're going to kind of build off of that and talk a little bit about the eval. So if you have heard Jeff Moore talk or you've heard any of the faculty in the cervical or lumbar courses, you know that at ICE, we talk about the process. And the process is how we would go through our evaluation from subjective to objective and explanation of findings in order to try and one, be extremely comprehensive and two, start building the bike figuring out what those asterisk signs are that we can do a test retest and show change relatively quickly and start to really build that therapeutic alliance. It's super important. When it comes to individuals with neurodegenerative conditions or different neurological issues, sometimes those things aren't as easy and the way that we would structure our subjective may be slightly different. And so we're going to go through that. The first thing we're going to talk about is the subjective. So when we're taking patient history, There can be a lot that is going on, especially if a person has an 8, 10, 15 year diagnosis with a neurodegenerative condition. Therefore, what we're going to want to do is before we take a full history, because sometimes that can take well over an hour if there is a lot of things that have happened and a lot of issues that may be more nocebos that have happened from lots and lots of interactions with healthcare providers. We want to know what a person's day looks like. 
when I'm kind of in a traditional outpatient uh, PT orthopedic eval, I'm often kind of zeroing in on patient behavior in regards to pain. And as much as that may be on board with somebody with a neurological condition, it's usually not the driving factor for them to come and see you. Oftentimes the same as someone who's in the older adult population who is seeing you for a loss of functional resiliency. And so in that case, what I'm going to be asking them to do is tell me about your day. That could mean when their caregivers come to help with different ADLs, IDLs, getting ready for the day. It could mean what is the expectation of you for the day? What are things that you want to be able to do? What are things that you have independence with? What are things that you require support with? What are things that you want to be able to do independently that you feel right now you can't? What do you feel like are the limiting factors for you being able to do those things? And if you are having issues, like we'll we'll kind of deep dive into things like having community access, because eventually for a lot of neurodegenerative conditions or after a neurological insult, a person may not be able to drive. And depending on their setting, if they're in a rural setting or are they able to access the bus systems, then it may be a really important conversation about one, how they're going to get to our appointments. Is it going to be a huge barrier because that might change our conversations? And then two, is there a way for us to help facilitate transportation with some sort of accessibility bus or some sort of system where part of our treatment is trying to figure out how to be more independent in the community? So that's definitely going to be something that I'm going to be deep diving into. The second thing that I'm going to be really deep diving into in the subjective, which sometimes in other orthopedic conditions, I don't necessarily as much is the home assessment. And we talked about this again in regards to geriatrics, but I think it's super important because there's another layer of complexity that can happen with medication regimes and gate aids and home aids that may be required. So things that I'm going to be asking about is how many stairs do you need to get into your house? Is there a railing? One railing, two railings, no railing. Is it on the left? Is it on the right? Can you navigate that independently? What's your home look like? Is it a one bedroom? Is it a bungalow? Is it a split level? Is it uh, two stories? If it's two stories, what is on the second floor? Do you need to get there all the time? How many stairs roughly? Is there a railing? Can you do that independently? What is your fatigue level by the time you get to the top of the stairs? Does that mean that you're going to be planning your day around only having to be going up and down the stairs as few times as necessary? Would you be willing to avoid doing something that you want to do because it's upstairs and that is too fatiguing for you to do? What does that look like? If you have a significant other or partner that is with you, are they providing caregiver support? Are you uh, getting somebody else coming into the home? Is there fatigue on board? One of the biggest things that happens in neurodegenerative conditions and after neurological insult is that the fatigue is oftentimes one of the primary complaints and it can make it really difficult for people to do all the things that they wanna do And it also becomes a significant barrier for physical activity participation. And we know that that is true if you've scanned any of the literature on physical activity guidelines in neurological populations. And therefore, that's probably something that we're going to have to be tackling, whether that be with energy conservation techniques and trying to find the optimal time for an individual to participate in physical activity Or it's going to be, you know, can we do more things like movement snacks that we've talked about that's going to allow a little bit more uptake of movement in a person's day, but isn't going to override their system so that they can't do their ADLs because we've exhausted them in rehab. Yeah, then the other thing that I'm going to talk about is different things like slips, trips, and falls. Have you had any falls in and around the home? We know that a significant portion of falls happen in the home itself. Do you use adaptive equipment for things like toileting and showering? Do you have any trouble getting into and out of those? Can we potentially facilitate a referral to home health, get an occupational therapist in the home to see if there's any ways that we can make certain tasks easier to manage? 
the other thing with a neurological population is that, especially when you're working with a neurodegenerative condition, is that oftentimes we're trying to optimize physical function, but also compensate for a progress, a progression in neurological symptoms. And that sometimes is really hard for us to wrap our brains around because we want to try and get people back to everything that they were doing in the past. And that can be a particularly challenging conversation if, for example, you're working with somebody with MS who had relapse remitting and was getting back to 90, 95% of their function after each relapse. And then it's become a little bit more progressive and there's more residual neurological deficit that is happening every single time now they're experiencing a flare up. So those are types of things in the subjective that I'm really going to be deep diving into. Because of that, my subjective component in my eval is going to be significantly longer. That can be really challenging because there's a lot of things from a neurological perspective we're probably going to want to see, which would mean that I'll probably be doing continuing evaluation across multiple times so that I can get a pretty good idea about neurological function. So the other thing then that I'm going to be kind of not necessarily testing completely, but on my radar is going to be the fact that oftentimes, unless there was a a sudden onset injury, these uh, impairments that we're seeing for physical impairment often can have a cognitive or mental health components to them and can be, um, these can be subclinical or under the surface that unless they're on our radar, we may completely miss it or attribute it to something else rather than um, something that may be uh, an important piece of information in regards to the neurological condition that we're seeing a person about. So things like insight, do individuals have orientation to time and space? We know, for example, with Lewy body accumulation in an individual with Parkinson's that um, they can have some cognitive issues. What is their attention like? Are they having trouble in the assessment? paying attention to you, maintaining eye contact, keeping their train of thought in a, in a story if they're recalling a narrative to us. Because if that's happening in the assessment and then the next treatment, there's going to be five other clinicians out in an open space all doing different things, you may not actually have a very effective treatment session because the ability for that person to pay attention to you and pay attention to what they're doing when there's so much external stimulus happening can be really tough. And so that might mean that for this individual, you're going to keep them in a treatment room if that's available. You may pick a time of day that's a little bit less busy so that you'll be able to have their full attention or as much attention as possible. And you may change how often, for example, you're switching tasks. Those are all things that you're going to consider if you know that attention span is something that is slightly impaired with this individual. Um, Things like memory, speech, mood and affect, behavior, impulse control, and executive function. So these are all different things. If you want, um, I can give you a little bit more resources on how to kind of look for this type of stuff. Um, But the last thing that I'm gonna mention in regards to the subjective is that if a person comes in with a caregiver, it sometimes becomes very easy for the caregiver either to override the person that you're talking to and take over the assessment, or it can be really common for it to be sometimes easier to be talking to the caregiver instead of talking to the individual. And so it's really important that you make sure that your focus is on the person that you are seeing, um, even if the, the caregiver is trying to, to kind of give you more of that backstory and it's super important information, but you want to make sure that you're including the person and not just talking about them um, in front of them. So, and that can happen a lot in their day-to-day interactions with different physicians, clinicians, um, because it just can sometimes be easier to get the narrative from a caregiver than from the person, but you want to make sure that you're trying to respect the fact that the person, the patient that you're seeing is the person with the condition and what they are saying is really important. Okay, so objective. We've talked about this before um, in regards to different things like vital signs in a neurological population, especially if there's a issue with regulation of different vital signs like respiratory temperature and um, heart rate, I'm going to be taking vital signs every single time a person comes in. We know that we have normative data. For example, if you're seeing somebody after a stroke, even if it was six, seven, eight months, I'm definitely going to be taking vitals every single time. 
The other thing is that if you're seeing an individual after a stroke, they may not have good regulation and orthostatic hypotension may be more common in this individual. So it's gonna be important for you to try and see if you can get an assessment. We actually have an established guideline for developing or, or for speaking about orthostatic hypotension, which is having a person lie down, take their blood pressure, have them stand up, take their blood pressure and look for a drop of about 20 millimeters of mercury between supine and standing if you take it in the first minute of them standing up. You're also going to be looking for subjective symptoms of lightheadedness, dizziness, all that type of thing. Um, I can have some individuals who, if I try and get them from standing to sitting, they can get really woozy. So trying to get them even from sitting to standing would be even more challenging. And so the other things that we're going to talk about outside of the objective is things like reflexes. How often are we busting out our reflex hammers and looking for lower extremity and upper extremity resources? If we have a, sub, uh, a suspected upper motor neuron lesion, looking for Probinsky's and Hoffman's, are we looking for cranial nerves? Do we know what those cranial nerves are? Do we know the potentially R-rated mnemonics for cranial nerves? Just in case there is somebody who is having something like a Bell's palsy, which is cranial nerve four, we want to make sure that we can kind of assess that and see what that facial droop is coming from. Is it a consequence of uh, lack of perfusion in the middle cerebral artery uh, subsequent to a stroke, or is it something that's related to a potential loss of cranial nerve four function? Those can both uh, happen and trying to figure out what that residual deficit may be is gonna be important. So other things that I, the last thing I'm gonna talk about in the subjective for an outpatient therapist is around tone and spasticity. So if you're seeing an individual, um, oftentimes if they are saying, oh, I'm just super, super tight, we may think, okay, well, I'm just gonna make sure that they're stretching and I give them a bunch of stretches to work on, which can be great. Um, but when we're thinking about neurological conditions, we have to try and differentiate between tone and resistance to passive stretch versus spasticity. And the way that we do that is by manipulating speed. So if you were taking a person through, for example, knee flexion and extension, and you're looking for any resistance to passive stretch, you're then gonna do that quickly. And if there is a catch that happens really early or throughout the range of motion, you're probably thinking that some of that tightness is related to spasticity and tone, which is neurologically driven, rather than something that is at the level of the musculotendinous junction. And that's a really important distinguishing factor because you, if you have somebody who has spasticity on board, you may be stretching them all the time, they're doing all the stretching and they're not seeing much change. And the reason for that is because we're not really dealing with tone, we're dealing more with spasticity. And that's where individuals may go into something like a Botox regimen to try and manage some of that spasticity to try to optimize their physical function. And that may be something that if you catch it, you can refer back to the neurologist or refer back to the PCP or whomever is taking primary uh, responsibility for that individual from the medical side of things. And it may be something that would really help improve function. So just kind of going through, um, I'm not gonna, this could be a whole hour long lecture, um, but if you're in outpatient and you're seeing somebody with a neurodegenerative condition, that's probably one of the things we're gonna see really common uh, is for individuals with Parkinson's, Huntington's, um, MS, all these different neurological uh, popu or neurodegenerative conditions that are coming up and people are being managed well medically. So there's they were having quite a bit of years with this neurodegenerative condition and able to live in the community. It's really important for us to modify our subjective to know what their day-to-day -day behaviors look like, really highlighting fatigue, any sort of assistance, any sort of support, what they're independent with, what they're not, what their goals are to be independent with, and try and really cater our intervention to that. Really deep diving into the home assessment, not only looking at stairs, but looking at you know where is everything located in the house, is there a barrier in regards to fatigue or physical resiliency that's preventing them from being able to do things like if their book is upstairs in their bedroom and they're downstairs, they won't read even though that's what they want to do because the idea of going up the stairs for a second time is just too fatiguing for an individual. Is that something that we want to be working on? Then from there, after we go through the subjective, objectively, we're gonna be looking at things like their reflexes, those are gonna be really important, taking vital signs, checking for specificity versus tone, and then going into our general function. So that's not to say that we're gonna completely avoid all of our general function tests. 
I think it's super important and they've been validated in a lot of neurological populations. So once I've kind of gone through some of those neurological things, then I'll probably go into my more general physical function. So things like the timed up and go, 30 seconds sit to stand, short physical performance battery, the two minute step tests or walk tests all have validity and reliability in neurological populations. And from there, I'm gonna have a really good picture of how a person is doing. And so from there, if there's an orthopedic complaint, then we can kind of deep dive into that, which all of this sounds like a lot, but I think it's really important for us, especially with something more complex like a neurological issue, for us to be able to tease out what is gonna be amenable to change from an orthopedic perspective, what are things that we're gonna to have to compensate around from a neurological perspective, and then how do we blend those two together to create a, a good, program of care that's going to allow an individual to live their best life the way that they want to and optimize that physical resiliency, potentially reduce the burden on caregivers because you're giving them the tools to be able to do things on their own. All right. That is all I have for today. Of course, I went over. I feel like I've just been doing the 20 minute PT on ices. Sorry, guys. I'm a little bit long winded today. Um, I hope you guys found that helpful. Uh, if you want to place any other comments in the bottom, I would really appreciate it. We're going to be deep diving into this a lot more in advanced concepts. So if you guys are interested in working with these populations, make sure that one, you've taken essential foundations online so that you know the background and exercise prescription. And then number two, that you sign up for advanced concepts. Our first cohort is starting March 11th. All right, guys, have a wonderful, wonderful rest of your week. I'm pretty sure I'm on the podcast on Friday, so I'll see you guys then. Otherwise, keep checking the Instagram because we're in DC and it's gonna be a ton of fun this weekend. Bye. Hey, thanks for tuning in to the PT on Ice Daily Show. If you enjoyed this content, head on over to iTunes and leave us a review. And be sure to check us out on Facebook and Instagram at the Institute of Clinical Excellence. If you're interested in getting plugged into more ICE content on a weekly basis while earning CEUs from home, check out our virtual ICE online mentorship program at ptonice.com. While you're there, sign up for our Hump Day Hustling newsletter for a free email every Wednesday morning with our top five research articles and social media posts that we think are worth reading. Head over to ptonice.com and scroll to the bottom of the page to sign up.